Dr. Larry Turka is, is Professor of Medicine and Scientific Director of the Transplant Institute at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. His research focuses on T-cell tolerance and transplantation and autoimmunity. He is a leader in translational medicine, serving as co-director of the newly formed Harvard Institute of Translational Immunology, as well as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Investigation and deputy director of the NIH-funded Immune Tolerance Network. Today, Larry brings us home with his presentation, Transplantation, the Art of the Possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, now I know that I'm truly powerful if you move the Board of Fellows meeting back five minutes for me, and I'll, my wife will be exceedingly proud. The pressure is on, I know, I know, and the timer's here too, so I'm going to start talking. So I should tell you that I went to medical school at a uh, nice institution down the road in Route 95 uh, in New Haven, and I came to Harvard first, I, I've had a hiatus in the middle, but I came to Harvard in 1985, convinced that I wanted to study kidney diseases, and like a good sort of nerd that I was, I was interested in studying how how many salt molecules and how many water molecules you ate and you excreted. And then I came to the Brigham and I realized that there was something much more interesting and I became absolutely inspired by patients who had had renal transplants, kidney transplants. And I spent the last 25 years or so of my career studying that. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you a little bit about the barriers that, have, that used to exist, where we are in solving them, some of the problems that we now recognize as a, as a result of our partial solutions and my dream or vision of what the future could be. So it's often said that medicine is as much an art as a science, and transplantation actually really started as an art more than a science. This is a very famous picture that you can see here of Saints Cosmos and Damien in the third century performing the first uh, art recorded example of a transplant. And they've transplanted the leg of an, what was said to be an Ethiopian onto the uh, limb of a gangrenous, uh, uh, the gangrenous limb of Justinian, who was a deacon in their church. Now, uh, those of you who in the audience are, who are surgeons will, know, and I've often been told, I'm not a surgeon, that surgeons are extremely optimistic during the operation, will note the incredible optimism here uh, as shown by the shoes that are in the bottom left corner of the painting, <laughs> assuming that the patient would walk away. Now, it's actually, we know now, quite doubtful that that person would have, but uh, transplants have now become a reality. The, I, I learned from my favorite source, Wikipedia, that the first actual successful tissue transplant was in a gazelle in 1837. It was a corneal transplant. Corneal transplants were actually done in people in the early part of the 20th century. But in most cases, the immune system recognizes transplants and rejects them. And it wasn't really until much later, through the advances of many, many people, and I'm not going to really tell you about my work. This is a history of the field and advances in the field that this, is, uh, that this has become successful. Now, the field has advanced so much that uh, we used to talk about heart transplants and kidney transplants and liver transplants, lung transplants. This is a hand transplant that was recently done by a team at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And this was, uh, this is, a lot of this work is actually now funded by the Department of Defense for uh, people who are injured in war, but this is actually someone who lost the use of both of his hands in that recent nightclub fire in Rhode Island several years ago. And when you think about what the impact is that this has on people's lives, I would invite you all to stop drinking your coffee, stop working on your iPad, stop checking your iPhones for the remainder of the talk, and you'll see for the next eight minutes and 39 seconds what this person's life has been like for many, many years until he was re-enabled by this transplant. So how were these advances made possible? And I, I, I won't tell you all the science, it's not the purpose, but much of the work uh, was done at Harvard. Uh, here are two people who won the Nobel Prize for these efforts. On the left is Baruch Benassarath, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, very basic scientific discoveries into how the immune system works, including how it rejects transplants. And on the right in the center is uh, Joseph Murray, who performed the first successful human organ transplant in the late 1950s. And here he is with dogs that he has successfully transplanted, and you'll recognize the quad of Harvard Medical School, where he's out there with his dogs. So that's all well and good. And a subject that Doug Melton touched upon, and that I'll come back to, is that now that we can do this, 
what's the barrier to doing it better and to enabling everybody to benefit from this. And one of this is the, is the organ shortage. There's a great website, I'd welcome you to check it out, called UNOS, N-O-U-N-O-S, which is a national organ distribution system. And you can't see it here, but you can kind of see it better here, that uh, there are 120,000 people at any given time waiting for a transplant of some sort. And the total number of transplants each year in the United States is only about 25 to 30,000. And you can do the math. That means that many, many people wait long periods of time. If you're waiting for a kidney transplant, on average, you'll wait three years. If you're waiting for another organ transplant, you may die before you get your organ transplant. And that's a sad fact of, of where we are right now. Uh, one of the things that has been discussed here is if you're I don't know, if you live in Massachusetts, you can anywhere in the United States, if you want to donate an organ, you have to say, yes, I want to donate. So what I, it's what I call presumed dissent. It's presumed that you don't want to donate an organ unless you actually say you do. In Spain, they have presumed consent. It's presumed that you want to donate an organ unless you say you don't. And their organ donation rates are twice what ours are here in the United States. So that's food for thought. But you can do the math and you can see that even that would not by itself change things. So Doug Melton talked very eloquently about, about stem cells, and they may be part of the solution to this problem. Earlier this year, a tracheal transplant was performed in Sweden with uh, stem cells that were made from the recipient's bone marrow and that were differentiated into the kinds of cells that you would need for a tracheal transplant. And this was put on a scaffold that was produced in London from a polymer or biomaterials that were made by a company called Harvard Apparatus here in Massachusetts. Um, I, I learned that Harvard Apparatus actually started in 1901 uh, when William Porter, who was a physiologist at the Brigham, decided that the instrumentations that he needed or the instruments he needed for his work were not available for purchase and that he started a company or he wanted to start a company to make better instruments. Charles Elliott, then the president of Harvard, gave him $6,000 to start that company a lot of money in today's uh, terms, and Harvard Apparatus was born, and they made these polymers. So even if we do all that, and we have a lot of good drugs now for transplantation, but transplants get rejected. Uh, there are two lines here. As in many graphs, the good line goes up and the not so good line stays flat. The line going up shows you the survival of kidney transplants after one year. And this is from an older period of time, but the trajectory is fairly similar. There's been an almost linear increase in how well kidney transplants do. And one-year survival rates routinely exceed 90% in virtually every center in the United States. But the half-life, the time point at which half of those graphs have ceased functioning, was about eight and a half years a quarter of a century ago. And it's about eight and a half years now. So we've not done very much better in getting these transplants to last. And at least in the case of kidneys, 20% of all people who get kidney transplants are getting re-transplants, meaning their original transplant rejected and they're getting another one. Furthermore, this happens despite patients taking lots of drugs. This is you know, an illustration, but most transplant patients will take dozens of pills each day to prevent their transplant from rejecting and to treat the complications of the drugs that prevent their transplant from rejecting. And there's lots of side effects. Infections are one of them. And you can see a uh, pneumonia, which is shown on the top left. And the, the brain scan shows a fungal lesion in the brain. There's retinitis shown in the bottom middle. And there's osteoporosis and vertebral collapse, which is a side effect of steroids taken for rejection. So uh, many of us who work in the field have a dream. And the dream is what you would take and what would be the optimal regimen to take if you had an organ transplant and you, know, you wanted to have uh, long-term survival of the transplant without any of these complications. And that's what the optimal regimen is on this slide. That is the optimal regimen. It's nothing, right? And that's the dream that we all should have, is how can you get patients to accept their organ transplants with some brief intervention, and they need nothing afterwards, and they are doing fine just as all of you here who don't have an organ transplant are not having rejection of your heart, your kidney, your lung, or your liver. And this is a dream that many different people around the country are working on, including scientists at Harvard. And David Sachs is in the audience, and he's one of the people who's helped pioneer this field at Mass General. 
And in work that, I didn't know he was going to be here before today when I prepared this, but in work that was done over a quarter of a century ago, he uh, helped pioneer a protocol which essentially said that if you do a bone marrow transplant to help reset the immune system and put some of the donor's immune system into the organ transplant recipient, you can perhaps create tolerance to the recipient of an organ transplant. And the first transplant that uh, he and his team at Mass General did was just over 10 years ago. And we are amazingly fortunate to have here today a woman named Jen Searle, who was the recipient of that transplant. And Jen, can I invite you to come up here? And she uh, was the first person that I'm aware of that had a transplant of this type and is now drug-free, at least the drugs that I know of, for 10 <laughs> years after her, and the only ones that I want to know of, for 10 years after her transplant. And she graciously agreed to come and join us and tell you a little bit about her experience. And maybe I can start by asking you, Jen. So I'm sure that I know David very well. He's a very careful, cautious uh, person. I'm sure he told you that this was, you were the first patient. It was experimental. You signed a gazillion forms of informed consent. He must have told you that there are risks. They don't even know all the risks. So why did you do this? What was your motivation? Uh, it was probably the easiest decision I've ever made, actually. Um, so I had a regular kidney transplant first when I was 13 years old. Um, and almost immediately after, I had a lot of problems with the immunosuppressant medications. Um, so by the time I was 14, I had uh, cataracts, vascular necrosis, osteopenia. But um, worst off was that I had these viral warts on the bottom of my feet. And that doesn't sound very bad, except these warts covered the entire half of my foot, and nothing would make them go away. So I had over um, a dozen laser surgeries where they would burn it down, a second degree burns, and I'd wrap it up with second skin, and it would grow back the same. I had a handicap permit in college. I was miserable. So basically, the quality of life wasn't there, and I would have jumped at any opportunity to get off of those drugs. And so let me ask you another question. How did it work for you? Tell me about the quality of your life now since uh You've been off drugs now for 10 years compared to before. Yes, uh, it's been amazing. I always say that I've been like a kid in a candy store with a new body that I just kind of do whatever I can because after this procedure, um, the, the warts went away. Um, the osteopeno actually started to reverse, which they didn't think would happen. Um, I am completely normal. Um, my foot is bandaged today because I just got back from hiking the Grand Canyon rim to rim to rim, <laughs> 45 miles in two days. Um, <laughs> I'm a marathoner, I'm a triathlete, I'm an, a I'm an athlete, um, which I never would have thought possible. I was the sick girl amongst my friends, and now I'm the athlete. Terrific. So I see, I see my time is up, and there may be other questions that, that we're going to get asked. So, uh, and I know the Board of Fellows meeting is coming up. So I'll thank you very much for your attention, and I want to especially thank Jen for being here. Thank you both, and uh, particularly you, Jen, for uh, sharing your time and uh, your courage with us for the work that you did. Let me just ask you uh, the first question, though, which is, um, how is this um, going to be a part of the personalized medicine platform, if you would? Sure. So I think somebody else made a comment similar to this, that there are, there are probably tens of thousands of patients, hundreds of thousands of <laughs> transplant recipients in the United States. We are pretty sure that some of them are probably tolerant of their organs and don't need any drugs or need far less than they, than they take. But we don't know who they are. And so what we need to do is to have a revolution in immunology, similar to the revolution that was discussed earlier in cancer, where in cancer we now have genetic diagnoses of types of cancers that subclassify that say, what are the drugs that you need? And we haven't done that very effectively yet in immunology. So we, our revolution would be uh, identifying who has what, um, who needs how much immunosuppression, and how to measure somebody's immune system, their immune response. And we just haven't done that yet. But that's, that's over the horizon. That, so the, for the future? For the future. Nearly. The near future. The near future. The near future. Okay. I'm not ready to retire yet. Uh, OK. So Good. The near future. Stick with this. And I just wanted to ask you, you said that this was a really easy decision for you. But what was your greatest fear going into this? Um, that I would have to take the drugs again. I mean, that was kind of. I think all I would let myself think that the worst thing that could happen would be that I would need to take these drugs again. And to me, that was the worst case scenario, because I couldn't imagine continuing to live like that. And what would you tell others that were faced with a similar decision? Um, I've a I actually talked to everybody who had it after me and kind of gave them the pros and the cons. But um, I wouldn't need to convince anybody who's had an organ transplant. Um, I'm friends with 
almost 100 people that I've, you know, we're a solid community and everyone's jealous of me and they're all waiting. They all want to do it um, and I want that for them. Fabulous. Thank you so much, both of you. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank much you. appreciated.